Hello, and welcome to episode 154 of Random Encounter, the RPG Fan Podcast. I'm your host, Derek Heemsbergen, and I'm Embryonics on Twitter. That's at E-M-B-R-Y-O-N-X. And today, it's just the, the dynamic duo of me and my lovely co-host, Greg Delmage. Hello, everybody. I am Greg Delmage, and I am Greg Delmage, or at Greg Delmage, rather, on the Twitter. And G Delmage, if you want to chat at me in our Discord. You could very well do that. Greg is the one who goes into the Discord and actually uh, fields questions from folks for the podcast. So I'm I not do. sure that we have any for this episode, but he is the one to, to reach out to if you have any burning questions for us. Mm-hmm. But uh, uh, about games. Yes, please. Please do that. Uh, well, guys, it's time for another uh, random encounter. And that means it's time to talk about some video games. My uh, big thing that I've been doing recently, I will get into later in the show. Uh, because I recently attended the Final Fantasy XIV Fan Festival 2018 in Las Vegas. And so I'm very excited about all of that, but I want to delve more into that probably towards the latter half of the show. Um, our schedule is slipping a little bit. We're, we're doing about every three weeks uh, episodes these days, but hopefully you all still enjoy them just the same when they come out. And uh, I will do the Rob Steinman uh, customary apology for something that may not happen. My radiators are kicking on. This is my first time living in the Midwest. So it gets cold here as it turns out. It's not like <laughs> Tucson, Arizona, where I can just wear, you know, a hoodie or like a hoodie and a long sleeve shirt. No, I have to wear a lot of layers and uh, it gets it gets quite chilly. So I'm living in a place with radiators for the first time. And oh, my God, they are so loud. So loud. Especially when they first like kind of kick into gear. Uh, they just kind of make noise the whole time they're generating heat. Oh, okay, good. They just hiss, and uh, it sounds like I left the bath on, and it's exploding all at the same time. I don't know. It's very odd. They don't like, um, do you get, like, the whole groaning and stuff as, like, the metal expands from the heat and stuff? Or... Yeah. Yeah, it's a whole thing. I mean, my apartment was fairly recently renovated. Like, we're the first people to live in this unit since it was renovated, and on my floor, I live in a seven-floor building, and uh, on my floor, I'm one of two tenants because everything else is still under construction. So it's like very nice and redone, but they still have these old ass radiators that make a ton of noise. It's also quite warm and cozy, so I can't complain. Uh, anyway. Pretty easy to heat those little spaces, I imagine. Yeah, just a one bedroom. So uh, that may happen, that noise. But first, I want to check in with Greg. Uh, I know you've been focusing on the RPG fan video side of things, which is a fairly new initiative for the site, yes? It is, yeah. We've um, been doing a lot of work, and obviously we don't want to blow too much of what we're working on uh, early, uh, but we've been just kind of testing out some content ideas to um, to kind of dip our toe in the water. We're not fully committing to a full video series overly much. I mean, Quentin has done what uh, he's gotten to, and then he got really busy at the holiday rush uh, at his work, so he's kind of slowed down, but he's going to have something coming out for everyone because that seemed to be really well received, and... Uh, um, and yeah, I, I, I think that he wants to get more of that stuff coming out and it's definitely a great place to, to begin. And then we have other things to kind of fill out our social media presence. And that's kind of what I've been working on. And a lot of that has been kind of building a d- database for that content. So I've been staring at spreadsheets a lot over the past few weeks, trying to build the, um, the database of games and such that we want to cover. And it's a lot. So, yeah. Uh, and you get that ready to hopefully start rolling out at least one of these segments for December. So look mm-hmm. forward to some fun stuff uh, about video games and you know know how about them and such. It's going to have a little bit of uh, some factoids and such. That is what we aim to deliver here at RPGFan.com <laughs> is coverage of video games. <laughs> That's true, and uh, there's definitely a lot of other like places that have done. The similar idea than what we're going to be working on, but again, we try to want to make it our, our own. So that's why they're, we're putting in that little bit of extra effort, a little bit of extra work and to make sure we're ready to go and we'll have something that feels familiar, but we'll still very much be like, oh, but RPG Ben did, did it like this, you know? So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, our uh, particularly our editor-in-chief, Mike Salvato, is very committed to quality. He has a very strong creative vision. And if you notice, sometimes seemingly innocuous things like news articles, on Final Fantasy XIV, uh, we'll have like really, really lengthy uh, and and well, cr- what am I trying to say? Like good write ups. Um, it's not just here's the news. Uh, Mike Salvato really likes to go in. He'll upload like super high quality assets to the galleries. So if you've never 
checked our uh, our media section on the site or if it's been a while you should check it because we've got like the highest resolution art and screenshots you can find for a lot of games in there and um anyway and so we've been getting some uh, good stuff too from scott one of our streamers has been going back to some of the older titles that he has and doing some capture footage to try it update back in the day when we had just those little teeny tiny jpegs that we just mm. can't find a better source for yeah to this day sometimes if i google uh, an rpg's name i will get in the image results one of the top ones will be an, an image from rpg fan and it's like a 200 by 200 postage stamp of grandia 3 or something <laughs> <laughs> so yeah i'd be you fan nice to fix those. Art searches that's yeah. why we discovered the website for um just finding art for my own little like kind of D forum rpg thing for character mm. and so that's what friend got in there so i completely understand Ooh, apparently i opened a treasure chest sorry folks i should oh. turn off the phone <laughs> that's okay I, I thought it sounded like your rice was done but a lot of folks actually came to the site through weirdly enough the top 20 psp games feature that one still tracks consistently as one of the most trafficked links on rpg fan as a whole and that's also why more recently um a lot of the the staff has put together some lists like the top 3ds games and uh vita games are both of those out i think they are the vita one just came out just this week actually i think okay yeah if i'm not mistaken i think it was yesterday or it was, it was friday it was re- in the last few days it just came up yes those are an uh, excellent read i did not uh have a chance to contribute to those but everybody who did did an amazing job so please please <laughs> go to our features page check those out get some recommendations am, for some uh, of those games you may have missed november 18th there we go Oh, okay. Yeah. So literally two days yeah. ago as of this recording. I am uh, I am arguably grateful that you weren't able to contribute because then I didn't have to fight you for talking about theater rhythm. That, oh my God. Ready. that is my favorite 3DS <laughs> game and you know it. I know. That's why I was like, I want to write about it, but I want to let Derek have the first pick. No. And I was that's very nice of you. happy to write about Majora's Mask as my runner up. Then I got to do both. So yay. Heck yeah. Yeah. No, they were great. To, great to they're a great source for people to just kind of go to and see, did I miss something? You know, cause not yeah. everyone's able to keep up on the hottest new releases. So it's a great way to go back, especially with how old the 3ds library is getting for its long lifetime. It's a lot easier to pick these titles up on the cheap. Yeah. And I mean, everybody likes a, a curated list, a top, whatever, you know, because yeah. part of the fun is, is seeing how things are ranked. And the other part of it is just like, okay, well, if all of these titles made this list, they're varying degrees of quality and I should probably check them out. So absolutely. Yeah, so I guess that that stands as our little uh, unintended plug. So go check those features out, please. please, please. <laughs> um, another thing that I know you're working on, Greg, which is a thing that we had discussed very early on before you started at the site because mm. uh, you are a, a father of a young gamer. Um, we wanted to get some perspective from you and from your daughter, Gwen. So you're, you're working on a new feature with her, right? That I am. Uh, we were... Uh... Back when with the holidays coming up, we thought it'd be prudent to kind of maybe do the first dip my toe in the water with introducing Gwen into the website and getting her ideas for concepts and such. And um, we're going to try and put together like a top suggested list of RPGs that she thinks is appropriate for kids around her age, whether it is outright playing or outright um, just watching, because obviously there's a lot of stuff that's a bit out of her skill range, but she just loves to spectate because Gwen's definitely a product of like the youtube generation where she just likes to sit and watch the amount of stuff she'll come to me with like did you know this about cuphead did you know this about this game like what are you playing she's like no i just watched someone play it on on youtube also they didn't do any swears it's okay i promise "Mm -hmm." scouts (laughs) guarantee they probably did swears (laughs) anyways (laughs) so um so there's been a few games that like obviously she's been able to to grasp and play like you know pokemon yokai watch stuff like that but then there's been others where yeah she just likes to sit back and take in so i kind of been talking to her about uh her her games that she thinks is appropriate for that and while i don't have the full list compiled and i don't want to spoil too much about her thoughts on them i can uh let people know uh that very importantly stuff like secret of mana and chrono trigger and super mario rpg did make that list so i feel like i'm doing parenting right she is a very cultured eight-year-old mm-hmm. and uh, i'll definitely be diving into more on that but uh what was fun about it too because i was really hoping to like keep it christmasy too not just with like uh, the holidays coming up and trying to get into the whole buy these games but more just uh kind of keep it with significant with the 12 days of christmas and i we discovered that gwen has been exposed to uh basically 12 rpgs exactly so it kind of worked out that uh, we can do like a list of her her 12 games of Christmas kind of thing. So 
We, her and I will be discussing that at great length because I we have it was a very very elaborate process to figure out what order all these games were. Number one was very obvious, but after that, she was very like anxious about trying to figure out how to place them in her top twelve order. So it was very fun, and then uh, from there we want to discuss as to why she ordered them the way she did and what she has to say about them. So I can kind of turn that into uh, a nice little quick feature, very similar to our uh, top. 3ds games and top psp games and such so that is or, excellent media games, sorry and that's yeah, something that you're be. not really going to see on uh, many other websites <laughs> no it's uh, definitely a gap that i think a lot of other websites kind of overlook and it's something that we see as reviewers too where people rail against certain games in a way and we've talked about this a bit on the on the podcast in the past that just we overlook who's this game meant for what's the audience of this thing right you know, like people will possibly have certain opinions on Pokemon Let's Go that are different from like what their kids will think about it. Mm-hmm. Just like I brought up in Little Dragon's Cafe, like I I see a lot of the, of the the seams when I was playing Little Dragon's Cafe, but Gwen can very easily overlook that and just get immersed and just love the fact that she has a dragon, embrace all these quirky characters, and just love it. So that I think is really important to to remember in context. As much as we as reviewers are mostly all adults it's very easy to be a lot more critical than what the intended audience would be. Mm-hmm. That's a great point. Yeah. Yeah. So this will give uh, a little bit of insight on what uh, a kid might think of a lot of these RPGs that we're so enamored with and see how exactly. they hold up maybe with her, her fresh perspective. Yeah. And it can help uh, adult like gam- parents of gamers and such really find the bridge of like how to where and when can I introduce my daughter or son or however they identify into the gaming world, because it can be a very tough bridge to to gap sometimes, uh, yeah. or sorry, tough gap to bridge rather. Is the there we go? I'm not tough destroying bridge the bridge. I'm building no, the bridge. Okay. I processed it, it the right way. Yes, exactly. But yeah, it can be hard to kind of figure out when and how should I introduce my children to what kind of games, and will they get the games of the past? Are kids all hung up on graphics and stuff like that? And you know, it turns out Gwen. Well, she does have opinions sometimes. She still has a certain respect for like good quality pixel art, like Chrono Trigger and Secret of Mana, but she also loves a 3D world like Breath of the Wild and Dragon's Cafe and stuff like that. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I look, look forward, forward to, to that feature about... and being informed. For sure. What are you guys going to play over the holidays? Did you uh, Do you have any fun gaming presents under the tree that you're going to play together? Well, uh, she is... Right now, she's out of friends, so I can't talk about this at uh, my own liberty. Um, she, uh, We managed to snag a uh, special edition Let's Go Eevee, Let's Go Pikachu Switch for Christmas as our big family Christmas gift. Uh, this year, she's at her dad's, so Santa will visit her when she's at her dad's place, so all the Santa gifts will go there. But the one that we'll get her, it's going to be one for all three of us because we all want it. <laughs> right. And so she'll have Let's Go Eevee to to probably be her big uh, her Christmas play. That is fantastic and fits right in with what we were just saying. Yeah, exactly. I, uh... Eevee is her favorite Pokemon, so she's going to oh. be pretty stoked. How good. How yeah, perfect. she's been very excited since she saw these games kind of come out. As much as she loves Pikachu and she was Pikachu for Halloween, yeah. Eevee is her jam. Right on. I uh, I picked that one up myself. I haven't played it very much at all. It, uh, it arrived while I was gone for the weekend at the Final Fantasy Fan Festival. So when I got Which is back... going to be a great segue. Yeah. Uh, uh, when I got back, I was just exhausted and I've sort of barely touched it. Um, but I, I'm excited to see more about it. Yeah, I might as well jump into Fan Festival just because yeah, we're on the subject. Doing? So I was very fortunate and I was able to attend... Final Fantasy XIV Fan Festival in Las Vegas. Um, I went there to cover it on behalf of my other uh, journalism outlet, CGM. And so I got to I got to go to the, the Rio Hotel and uh, watch all of the Fan Fest stuff in person. Um, they, they were streaming it all on Twitch for free this year, with the exception of the two concerts that they held there. In previous years, you had to actually buy like a stream key to watch the proceedings, and they were like 30 bucks or something. Um, so this year they kind of eased up and allowed everything to be broadcasted. But I think there's a certain magic to being there in the room and experiencing the energy for yourself. Oh, um, yeah. That I, just be everyone out there psyching out with you. Yes, I'm really easily swept up in the emotion of uh, excited crowds. I've noticed like anytime I ever go to a concert or like a movie or, or a, a theater production or something and people get really excited, it tends to like wash over me and make me... I kind of choke up easily. Um, so, I did that. 
Yeah. So when I was at Fan Festival, um, it, it launched with the the keynote address, which is where they announced Final Fantasy XIV's third expansion, Shadowbringers. It looks super cool. It's coming out in summer 2019. And uh, uh, yeah, it, it's thematically taking a little bit of a shift for Final Fantasy XIV. Um, up to this point, the story has been that you're the, the warrior of light, basically the savior of the world. But there's been this thread running beneath everything that uh, kind of people haven't really been sure how it was going to factor into everything or how important it was. But there's this idea that um, light and dark need to be balanced in the, the world of uh, Hydaelyn in Final Fantasy XIV. And things that you've been doing as a warrior of light have been steadily tipping the balance in favor of light. And that in itself is not a good thing. And it's now reaching the point where there's going to be sort of like a light-based apocalypse where light is going to engulf everything and your world will be reduced to nothing. Um, so because of that, uh, you need to now take up the mantle of the warrior of darkness. And uh, we're not really sure exactly what that's going to entail, but the really slick looking CG cinematic that they showed us at Fan Festival showed the uh, the sort of player character stand in um, that they have in all the CG trailers. He switches through a bunch of jobs while he's trying to fight this like light goddess looking thing. And uh, at the end, he finally switches his job to Dark Knight, which is actually a job that's in the game already. So it's interesting that they're making that into like the sort of poster of the expansion. But he switches to Dark Knight, and he's finally able to, to prevail over her. Um, and it's uh, very, he's very brooding, and it looks very dark and kind of edgy. But uh, oh, hello there, hammering. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't heard you recently. So uh, yeah, it's it's going to be kind of an interesting shift. Um, most of the main features that they talked about for the expansion were things that we expect to be coming in a new Final Fantasy XIV expansion, like the level cap will raise, we'll have new dungeons, we'll have new areas, we'll have a couple of new jobs. Um, one surprise is that the long-requested Blue Mage job is making its way to Final Fantasy XIV. I it saw be... that in the promo art. I was very excited for that. Yeah, it looks it looks really cool. Um, it's actually coming before the expansion, Shadowbringers. It's going to come in the next major patch for the game, which Ooh. is in January. Um, Happy and, New Year, y'all. Yeah, and it will be. it's going to be different. It's Final Fantasy XIV's first ever so-called limited job. And what that means is... It is not really designed to be a standard job that you play in parties all the time. Um, they're capping it at a lower level to begin with. It's going to cap at level 50. Right now, the level cap is 70 and will raise to 80 with Shadowbringers. So it's going to start at 50 cap. And uh, it's intended to be something that you kind of play solo um, because you, you can get into parties, but there's a bunch of restrictions on like you can't auto group with other players using it because it doesn't fall into one of the conventional roles. Um, you can't take it into certain uh, content, I think. I just I know that there are a lot of restrictions in place, but the main idea is because you need to learn monster abilities per the lore of the Blue Mage class, um, you have to actually like fight monsters that use certain attacks, see them, and then defeat the monster, and you'll have a chance of learning it. So right. there's like a huge there's like 49 abilities to start out, which is more than any class has, I believe, on their hot bar to begin with. Um, and you can only set like 24 of them. But anyway, so the main sort of objective of, of it is to go out into the world, fight monsters and learn their abilities. And you go into this special solo content like instance called the Masked Carnival, where you go against waves of enemies using your Blue Mage abilities and you have to triumph over them by exploiting their weaknesses and stuff. So it's interesting. It's it's quite a different um, take on a class for Final Fantasy XIV. It's not like your typical... I'm going to switch to Blue Mage, and now I'm going to be a magic DPS in all my parties. Like, um, That's, so it'll be sounds right. like it's becoming like um, they're getting a little Pokemon Go in your Final Fantasy XIV. There's definitely a collection aspect to it that I find very enticing. Yeah, and uh, they are still adding their more new jobs in the Shadowbringers expansion, which will be sort of the the typical jobs. Um, another thing they're doing for Final Fantasy XIV is they're really upping the cross server communication type stuff. Um, they're basically going to make it so that uh, you can hop between any server on your data center, which is kind of like a cluster of servers. At present, there are just two data centers in North America, and they're about to raise it to three and kind of restru uh, restructure, reshuffle where all the servers are. But with the new systems they're putting in place, um, as long as my friends are on any of the like seven or eight servers on my cluster, I can just hop between servers instantly. No, no fee, no 
process, you just click on like the teleport crystal and choose where you want to go. So um, it seems like accessibility and like ease of, of cooperation are really big key points for this expansion. Well, that's uh, important. I mean, yeah. the servers are there essentially to have separate instances of the same world, but just to kind of lighten the load on the entire yeah. system. So then everyone's all grouped on one. Now, how are they like, it just seems though, how are they going to mitigate that? Like what happens if all of a sudden everyone just dumps onto one of the servers, for example? So the server that you start on is considered your home world and whatever you're visiting, it's uh, whatever, whenever you hop over, it's like a guest or visiting world. Um, you can do most things that you would do on your home server with the exception of um, a handful of like key things. One, you can't, um, you can't sell items on the markets of guest worlds. So that'll oh. keep the economies of each of those for tanky. You can buy stuff, but you can't sell. Oh, that makes um, sense. You can't own an in-game house on a guest world because right. there's like a limited number of plots. So that keeps people from like server hopping and, and hogging all the land or whatever. Can't just get uh, a timeshare, no? <laughs> right. Just find a friend. Actually, that is a thing. You can like invite friends to have partial property uh, ownership of your house and give them access to it. Oh, neat. Here's yeah. the keys. We are at this level of our relationship. Right? So cool. Um, yeah, so th <laughs> there was a bunch of other things. Uh, nothing nothing that would, like, impede day-to-day. -day. Oh, I just want to hop over and play a dungeon with my friend. But, like, some things that will sort of keep the balance um, set between servers. So, so you don't kind of like, overstay your welcome. <laughs> yeah, and the nice thing, like, you can actually, they said you can stay on a guest server as long as you want. You hop over and you're there. Like, even if you log out, when you log back in, you'll be in the same spot. But, oh, cool. Um, so that's the last place you basically were. Mm -hmm. So it's it's pretty uh, freeing, I think, but they're just doing what they can to make sure that everybody still kind of has like their base server that they're from with, with all their like home stuff. So that's um, important. Yeah. So anyway, I'm getting long winded into technical details here, but okay. um, so I was at I was at FanFest. I got to see the live announcement of all that stuff. Oh, uh, they are adding a new race to the game, which is heavily, heavily, heavily a implied lot. to be the Viera from Final Fantasy Tactics, or sorry, 12. Oh. Yeah, Tactics A2, Evilis, basically. Evilis world, yeah. Nice. Yeah, so bunny peoples. Yeah, and I'm wondering if uh, that'll also introduce audiences to more lore about them and such. Yeah, so in uh, in the Stormblood expansion that's about to wrap up in uh, part one, January, part two, March. So by March, Stormblood will be wrapped up. Throughout that, there's been the Return to Evilis raid series which yep. um, has featured some iconic locations from Final Fantasy Tactics in 12 and some characters like Begomnan, the Bounty Hunter, and Delita and Ramza from Tactics. Uh, Yoshi P, the director of the game, hinted that in the final leg of that, which comes out in January, we're going to see, uh, like the way that he phrased it, it was like he showed a picture of a character wearing Balthier's armor, which is a new reward that you can get from the new dungeon. Slick. And they were like, you'll see a character that's uh, strongly connected to Balthier. I wonder who it could be. <laughs> so it sounds like Fran is going to appear both as like a reference slash cameo and also as a, uh, a tease for the Viera race coming out in. Oh, the not Pinello. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he did save her from being kidnapped. But... It's true. Yeah. Now, the thing is, will up until this point, uh, when I was uh, speaking to the lore comment, like we've only seen Viera as female. So will there be a male option? Because there's a male and female for each race. Is there not? Mm -hmm. Or no? Yeah, there oh, is. Yeah, there is. Okay, yeah. Yeah, originally in the, the base version of Final Fantasy XIV 1.0, they only had um, male Rogadin and like female Makote the cat girl. So That's where I was confused. I was like, I was couldn't remember, but I feel like I've seen the male Rogote. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they have since implemented uh, both options for every race so yeah i would think that they would introduce male viera unless what they do is introduce two races and it's like female viera and male bonga or something which yeah, i could see them doing it to kind of skirt it because in the end the, the races in that game are just skins they don't do any stat bonuses or any skill bonuses correct right yeah it, i mean there's like a, a minuscule effect on your stats but it's so well, minor that that nobody notices it or cares like it's i, I mean it's like you know, 0.01% as far as I know. So it really doesn't matter that much. Um, I just want them to make Moogles playable. My God, that'd be so cute. You'd be, yeah, just, oh, uh, what are the the little folk? Uh, Malatha? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just them running, like a party of them and Moogles running around, like the squishiest little, like, Malfurry. death party. Yeah. I mean, they already life. have, 
I mean, Moogles feature prominently in 14, but they could do like the Evil East Moogles, the kind of taller proportioned ones. Yeah, they look like Mont Blanc. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, so cute. That would be pretty great. I yeah. meant that. Mm-hmm. So uh, anyway, all of those details aside, I, I got to go to Fan Festival. I did. Um, this is, It feels kind of odd plugging this on the RPG Fan Podcast, but um, <laughs> over at CGM, I did do uh, an interview. I, I was part- participated rather in like a group interview Q&A session with the director of the game, Naoki Yoshida. Mm-hmm. So if you go over to cgmagonline.com, you can read my interview. Uh, I keep saying interview. It basically was an interview. The results of the Q&A session that I wrote up um, you can read that if you want some more Shatterbringers details. But yeah, so I was there. Um, oh my God, I do not like Las Vegas at all. <laughs> I've yeah, it's, it's never held appeal to me to be honest. No offense I, to people from Las Vegas. It I'm sure it's all kinds of nice, but yeah, I've never had I that think, appeal to it. I think it's just not my scene. I've been there. This is my third time going, and I went to a previous fan festival in Las Vegas as well. But um, back when I lived in Tucson, my roommate. He's from Las Vegas, so when we went, we stayed with his parents in um, Henderson, which is kind of on the outskirts of Las Vegas. And uh, I think having that separation made me a lot more comfortable, like being able to uh, go back to somewhere quiet and not just super boisterous and loud and uh, bright. Yeah, it's a very party place. Yeah, and I'm just not like, you know, I'll, I'll... unwind and have fun and uh, I, I can party a bit but like vegas is just too much for me and also the it was so dry and being in a hotel that uh, allowed smoking was just like ugh. oh interesting yeah i haven't seen i haven't been in a building in ages that allows smoking it throws me off every once in a while when i find that yeah i'm not a smoker and it uh it really like dried my skin out and stuff i so i was i was very glad to go on the trip to experience fan fest um it was like I was excited to get in um, because I thought I was going to miss it uh, originally. So it kind of like came as a nice surprise that I was able to get in. Oh, great. Um, But uh, yeah, it was a good time. Um, Vegas isn't really for me, but fan fest is fantastic. And even if they have it in Vegas next time, I will still go because it is super fun and shout outs to uh, Royo and uh, Hatsumi who I made friends with uh, at fan festival people I met for the first time. Uh, Twitter, one Twitter friend and one, friend of a friend who I ended up meeting and we're just super, super, super cool folks. Um, one of the best parts of playing an online game like that is the community. So it's really amazing when you can make a connection like that and have it pan out so well. Like we had such natural uh, chemistry. It felt like we'd been friends forever when we were hanging out. So Oh, fantastic. Which you were speaking very highly about. They had that video because it's the end of what's the anniversary are we coming up is the fifth uh, year. Fifth. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they had that anniversary video, which you were, you spoke, on Twitter very highly about, about that effect of the, the community, the connection, the world that's been built in around we're born and such. Yes. Yes, very much so. And that was a big thing that, that they kept touching on whenever they had um, keynote presentations and such, they were just like, this wouldn't be happening without this community, without, without these fans being here, without all of you, well, we wouldn't have this event. So um, I think that everybody on both ends of the exchange, both the fans and the, the team making Final Fantasy XIV are aware of how strong that is and how important it is to foster it going forward. It's absolutely key. Like we, we have seen over the years many MMORPGs come and go because of the fact that they have a lot of ambitious ideas and uh, execution seems to be great, but if the fan base isn't there to support the product, it just it can't sustain itself. Yep. So... 14 i mean we've said it a billion times but they really rose from the ashes and made it a game that people love playing myself included so is phoenix a summon yet in that game <laughs> uh there's there's phoenix as a boss and there's suzaku which is a separate boss oh but go. no phoenix that you can summon or anything one question i have for you before we move on from ff14 is yeah, yeah. what was the greatest photo op because i know there's been fat chocobos to get your photos on before okay so i didn't get to do it which is a bummer um i had a, i had a lot of like meetings and I had to do writing and stuff. So I couldn't Stop really being so st- important, Derek. Oh, I, I couldn't stand in any <laughs> line for very long, but they had this um, like 3d photo booth thing. I've never seen anything like it before. You basically, they had people get on this um, like disc shaped platform and you would strike a pose and they had three, uh, 360 degree cameras that would oh, rotate that the platform rotated and it would get you all around. And so, you know, you would get, at the end of the session, I saw my friends do it. They give you like an MP4 video of you rotating on the uh, on the platform, as well as like a boomerang on Instagram and and a still photo. It was so freaking cool. And seeing and the was things. And a background. 
Uh, yeah, I, I forget what the background was. It was like, I think it was a Shadowbringers themed background or something. Okay. Yeah, but uh, it was just like a really cool 3D photo thing. Gotcha. I wish I would have done one. A green screen thing, and then they kind of immersed you in the world or something. That would have been neat too. Yeah, that's. I think that's what they did. So. Oh, cool. Mm -hmm. That is very neat. Super neat. Yeah, in the past, you're right. They did have a fat choker, but they did that at uh, E3. Yes, and, that's I right. Believe they, I that's probably part of their whole um, marketing package because you, you do see these things make the tour around and other uh, different conventions as they go around, which when you're investing that money, much money into an elaborate uh, giant chocobo to get your photo on, you're going to get your money's worth out of it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I can't imagine how much those things cost to run too. Oof. Well, exactly. To, to get built and then let alone transport them across the country intact. Like, Seriously. you know, our years in the past, uh, my fiance and I got shots done up on the big giant T-Rex they had set up at uh, PAX, which again, I'm sure that thing toured wherever ARC was for that entire year. And like getting that around the country, I can't imagine is easy or cheap. Yeah, right. You need a semi or like a semi on top of a semi. <laughs> exactly right. Depending on how it comes apart. And yeah, it's it's incredible the amount of money that's put into the marketing machine at these conventions and to immerse you in the world of the game as best they can on top of that. Like the giant Rathian for um, Monster Hunter or sorry, Rathalos for Monster Hunter mm -hmm. World when it was coming out was really cool. But it's just it's impressive and scary all at the same time. <laughs> Just to, if you if you stop and think too long about where well, all the money going into it and where it could go otherwise, but at the same time, it just makes such a mark on your memories too. It's yeah. it's fascinating. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm very grateful that I had the opportunity to go to that convention and and mm. soak all that ambiance up. And uh, now I'm even more excited to play Final Fantasy XIV than ever. So. Uh, you will not hear me shut up about it anytime soon. <laughs> uh, or much less anybody else in RPG fan. A lot of people are big fans. It's, it's something true. I, every time a new expansion comes out, uh, so Mike Solosi was speaking about this as well, that it just, you get that itchy trigger finger to want to like jump in. Mm -hmm. And they usually go out of their way to try and make it accessible whenever there's a big update like this. Like you can, I mean, I wouldn't do this just because it's not the way I like to play, but you can now buy items, like you can spend real money to have them like boost a character to max level for you and clear all the stories so that you can start on right with the new stuff right away with everybody else if you wanted to. Huh. But, uh, a little bit of a fast track. Yeah. Or you can spend money to buy someone's account. I don't know. Is that still a thing? I know that was a big thing in World of Warcraft. I don't know if that's it, yeah, a thing with this community. Yeah, right? It used to be for Final Fantasy XI, too. But, oh, was uh, it? I, I, I don't know. They've mitigated that somehow, or not really. I don't know if they can really control that, right? Yeah, maybe it still happens, but yeah. the fact that you can pay to uh, boost your own character probably mitigates. We cut down it. They may as well get the cut themselves <laughs> instead of letting someone else get it. It's yeah. a smart business move, really. Mm -hmm. They know what they're doing. Well, uh, the only other thing that I've really delved into recently, I played this actually on the plane to and from Las Vegas. It was my first time experiencing it, so I'm pretty behind the curve on this one. But I finally jumped into Night in the Woods. Ooh. I believe that Caitlin was speaking pretty highly of this. Um, Agreed. On the podcast a while back. And uh, unfortunately, she is actually raiding tonight in Final Fantasy XIV, so she's unable to be here. Uh, Fortunately, unfortunately, I'm sure she's yeah. not sad about it, but... <laughs> Good for her, bad for us. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But uh, Night in the Woods is the, uh, how would I describe this? Like snarky, kind of occult, like text heavy visual, not visual novel, but like adventure game starring a sarcastic college dropout cat named May. Is it like for, like, it, it seems to me from the, outs, uh, the outside, it's a bunch of millennial animals. Uh, am basically. I, am, I, am I wrong? But More or less. Hipster animals, yeah, I guess. No. Uh, the writing is very contemporary. It's um, intentionally uh, omitting a lot of punctuation and like uh, eschewing grammatical conventions to effect, which I think is clever. Um, the story goes that May uh, is is a 20-year-old cat person, and people don't seem to really acknowledge that they're animal people. I don't know. Uh, she's a cat. She went to college. She dropped out. She moved back to her sleepy little town of, I believe it's called Possum Springs? Something like that. Um, she moves back to her hometown, which is a very quiet little podunk sort of place. And uh, when she gets back, she's just trying to sort of pick up her life uh, where she left it. Um, she's trying to reconnect with the friends that she left behind and um, see what's changed and what hasn't in the town. And she finds that... Uh, you know, some people aren't ready to just welcome her back with open arms. Um, 
some people are excited that she's back, but uh, there's a lot of very self-aware writing. May May explores this like idea that she's kind of a failure, um, and the game isn't afraid to to delve deep into that stuff. It, it doesn't really. I mean, it's it's not like overly subtle about it. May says things like, "I'm a piece of garbage. I'm a nightmare person. I'm never going to do anything with my life." Uh, there's a scene That's fairly really early in the game. Cool. Yeah, where she goes to a, she gets invited to like a, a party out in the woods and she starts drinking and her friends are like, maybe you should cool it. Like, we're, we're watching over you. Don't don't drink anymore. And she sees her ex. And so she's like, oh, I have to drink more to deal with him. And she, like you as the player, you have to click on the uh, beer to progress the game. Uh, even though you're like, May, stop doing this. And she continues drinking. And after a few beers, she like, basically uh, she stands up and starts making a fool of herself and like saying all kinds of stupid stuff. And then her uh, childhood friend gives her a ride home and all of the dialogue options uh, that may has they're written in like uh, perfect prose, but like perfect grammar. It'll say things like B I am so sorry for my actions tonight. I truly owe you the most sincere of apologies. And then when you click on that, May will be like, I'm sorry, I'm a piece of garbage. <laughs> <laughs> so like everything comes out all drunk, even though you select, you know, the, the proper thought, which I thought was very clever. And I feel like it's very on point. I've had someone describe that exact instance to me when they were just like, I was so drunk. And what I felt I was saying made all the sense in the world. But what they told me I said was not at all what I thought I said. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I don't think I've ever seen a game do that before. Uh, the very clever way of handling drunkenness. So, um, yeah, it seems like Night in the Woods themes have to do, a lot to do with sort of like finding your place and some existentialist dread. But uh, it's also got occult themes. I haven't really gotten too deep into that. But on, I think, the first night of May being back in town, she's like at her friends with the diner. Sorry, at a diner with her friends. And when they leave the diner, they just find a severed arm on the ground. And they're like, uh what's that yeah and they're like may you poke it and so it goes into like a little uh like mini game where you control may's arm like poking the arm with a stick <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's very comical um but i have a feeling there may be some dark stuff lying beneath the surface because may's had a couple of dreams that have been fairly dark and ominous um but then during the daytime she's just sort of lamenting her life and her station and everything so it feels I'm, very I'm, relevant yeah, it's very, very modern is, is yeah. the most I can say about the style. There's definitely a lot of people out there, I feel, who are stuck in that same place these days. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's got a very nice art style. It's uh, like a very smooth, kind of cartoonish animated style. Um, I don't really know how to describe it. A lot of the characters, I think, look like um, paper cutouts, kind of. That's I'd say that's a good way to describe it. Yeah, the art style is really neat. Mm -hmm. it's pretty um and i haven't noticed a ton of music but there is a like may used to play in a band and i guess i still have one so there's a few mini games where they're like come on may we're gonna we're gonna play a song you're on bass and she's like i barely remember how to play bass and i don't even know the song and it just launches you into the mini game where you have to like play it by pressing the buttons at the right timing it's it's funny and i was so gonna say do you just sit there and play d the whole time because that'd be great <laughs> well yeah i mean it <laughs> Yeah, just brr, brr, brr. no, it's uh, afterwards they they comment on it. So like, if you do badly, they're like, "Wow, you did terribly." It should be like, "I told you, I don't even know the song." Um, but if you do well, they're like, "Hey, you uh, picked that up pretty fast." And she's like, "I don't, I don't know how, but sure." So it's <laughs> not required to proceed, but yeah, it's just sort of like a, a little bit of flavor to add on to it. So yeah, I'm I'm pretty impressed with the game so far. Um, if I have a criticism, it is that it is pretty laboriously paced. I'm finding mm. that you have to kind of like, there's a structure of um, you go back to May's house, you go to sleep and then you wake up and you sort of wander around the town until it triggers the next story beat. And uh, once that's over, you typically go back to her house and sleep again. And the process repeats anew and you visit some new areas in the meantime, but a lot of it is kind of crawling through the same town screens until you figure out where it is that you want to go. Okay. Um, and um, does it offer, cause you were saying earlier about the whole party thing and the, but like you had to click on the beer to proceed so you couldn't like try and help may take ownership of her drunkenness. Right. Like, which is what I wanted to do. Is there a lot but... of choices or. Uh, I don't know. I, I actually have no idea. Like if there's any branching paths in this game or multiple endings or whatever. Um, I, I haven't looked that up and I'm kind of curious if there are, because I feel like 
at least in that one scenario I was in, I had no control over it. Like I tried doing everything I possibly could have. I clicked on everything in the area multiple times and it would not let me proceed until I clicked on the beer. So um, I know that they have updated Night in the Woods since release with some extra content. So I don't know if that's like a branching thing or if it's after the epilogue or what, but. Yeah, or if there's some stuff crucial to the story and it has to be played out and other stuff, you do get some more choice and such, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so I guess we'll find out. Yeah, no doubt. But, uh, well, I think, you know, this is going to wrap it up for us today. This is kind of a bite-sized episode, but Greg and I uh, were the only people available to do this on kind of short notice right now. Uh, it's been about three weeks since our last episode, so I didn't want to push it out anymore. Um, I wanted to get something out for you guys. But uh, that's really all we've been playing and doing. Um, we've got it's some true. fun stuff coming up. Like, Yep, we've got Game of the Year. Mm-hmm. That's going to be a thing soon because yep. we're coming to that end of the year and Music of the Year and all that sort of fun stuff. We sure are. Um, and then we got people playing games. <laughs> yep. like uh, we'll Hopefully be here. Yes, I want to talk more about Pokemon Let's Go, Eevee, and Pikachu. Uh, Greg just barely touched upon the fact that he is getting it. And I've also only put maybe like half an hour into it myself. So... Uh, I want to get maybe Alana or Peter onto the show. I know that they yeah. played it and they have thoughts, so we will delve into that on in the next episode for sure. Absolutely. Um, hey, Derek, before we go, we do have one good question from Cyanide. If RPG Fan is an RPG, what class and level would you be at RPG Fan? Oh, good question. Um, well, I've been an RPG Fan over eight years now, so... I'm not the most senior person on staff, but I've I've been here a minute, a hot minute, if you will. Um, <laughs> Very hot minute, sir. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I used to do. I mean, I've I've had a lot of positions here, um, from writing to proofreading to participating in the podcast to hosting um, to uh, like interviewing and uh, p- like PR liaison and stuff. So I've done I've done a lot of things. Um, you have my gosh. What would I be in the in, back in the day? I would say I was a healer when I was proofreading people's uh, work all the time. Um, these <laughs> days, I'm more of a DPS since I'm putting all the, the stuff out there. I think people like Mike, who has to Mike and Alana, they have to sort of coordinate everything. I think they're the tanks. I would say. Oh, I can see that. Call so I'm more shots. of a yeah, I'm more of a DPS and uh, probably probably a caster because that's my style. And uh, I don't know, moderately high level. I was going to say, would your eight years equate to eight level 80 or just level eight? Like, what's our cap here, right? Mm, that is a good question. Well, I would say the cap would have to be whatever the level is of the person who's been here the longest, which would be Mike Salvato. And he's been around since the early Lunar Net days. I don't even know how many years now. Like, yeah, he's got to be almost 99. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, honestly, uh, this is, I'm probably going to sound terrible here. I'm going to pick this up or uh, pull it up because I don't want to say something stupid. I want to say it's been since like 99. Um, Mike Salvato has been here since yes, June, 1999. So that would you make him stuff. level 19. Let's take that. So yeah, we'll I'm, we're I'm a level, level, level 20 cap. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. And what about you, Greg? What's your class? Uh, I would say just based on where I am, which I apparently, I just got like a slight upgrade in where I was moved around in the staff as, uh, Mike acknowledged the fact that you're not just doing podcast stuff anymore. You're doing a bunch of things. So I'm kind of like general contributing staff. So I'm going to borrow right from final fantasy five. And I'll say I'm like a level, like a level two freelancer. <laughs> Ooh. I can use all the weapons, kind of. <laughs> you can. You know what? I think you're less of a freelancer and more of an onion knight. Oh, yep. I'll take it. Yeah. Because you're you're like, you got the potential. You're going to be like top of the class one of these days. You're, okay. you're already amazing. You can already do so many things. But it's still a, a slow build. There's a lot of work that has to go into mastering it all. Jeez, yeah. Not, I didn't mean to disparage you. I just meant to say that Onion Knights are probably stronger than Freelancers. That No, I'm totally... Da- I, I got that. I mean, it's not that I thought you were saying I'm handsome and I make people cry, but... You are. You know. but <laughs> are Onions handsome? <laughs> no, or is it just the night cry? <laughs> they make people cry. Yeah, they sure do. I'm layered. I'm layered like an onion. Ooh, multifaceted. Mm-hmm. Somebody... No, oh, sorry. my God. <laughs> that is not the kind of show we are running here. Greg! <laughs> you should know that oh no it's the meme police it I sure know. is the fun <laughs> police is here time to log off that's true let's let's do that thing 
Well, if you guys being uh, you guys being the listeners have any other questions, comments, or spare potions, a la the one that we just answered, uh, responded to, drank, chugged like a potion, I don't know. You can send those uh, our way. You can email us, podcast at rpgfan.com, or you can get in touch on the Discord. Uh, just tag Greg on it, and uh, we will get you set up. If you don't have a link to the Discord, you can find that on the RPG Fan main page um, towards the top. It is pretty noticeable, so hopefully you can find it. And if not, send us an email, and we will hook you up. You can yeah. also follow us on Twitter at RPGFanCom, and you can like our Facebook page at Facebook.com slash RPGFanCom. Subscribe and to Instagrams. us on And the Instagram, that's right. Subscribe to us on iTunes through the RSS feed, and check out our Instagram. Oh my gosh, Steph, one of our social media editors, does the most amazing stuff on Instagram. She makes all these custom images. Um, yeah. She'll do like review digests sometimes. She'll do art galleries for games with uh, art that we haven't seen in a long time. So she is on top of it. The digests are really nice. Like it, it makes us feel like we have a magazine. I know they're like magazine quality. It's yeah, it's fantastic. Not to toot her own horn, but they're amazing, and she's amazing. So. Well, we'll toot Steph's horn anytime because yeah. Steph's great. And Steph that sounded great. like a weird euphemism. We're gonna walk and away from that. It, well, it didn't until you made it one. Ah, oh, you're guilty. Guilty. <laughs> Well, we have so many avenues for you to communicate with us through, so please pick one of them and uh, fire your your buckshot, and we will get back to you. <laughs> so, <laughs> whatever. Spray and pray. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in, everybody. For me and Greg, we appreciate you listening, and we will see you all later.